Hi everyone, Rupert Goff here from The Mortgage Lab. I sat down today with Nick Goodall from CoreLogic and we discussed the latest changes in the property market. Hope you enjoy the interview. Hey Rupert, uh, nice to catch up once again, mate. Uh, good big opportunity to firstly touch on what's happening from a data perspective, but really good to hear what's happening at that front line through your experience too. So, so to kick things off, I think we're going to work through um, the latest data that we're seeing, especially from a values perspective. I think um, when we released our June house price index data, there was a few surprises in there. And the key part of that surprise was that we saw some weakness cropping up in some regions. So in general, we're talking about the market is slowing down. We saw 1.8% growth over the month of June, which was down on about 3.1% back in uh, April. Um, so we are seeing the slowdown occur across the board. But what was really interesting was not just the 12 of the main 18 regions slow down, we saw three areas actually go slightly backwards in the value data with the house price index and that's been backed up by some of the the rights house price index data uh, recently as well and the key ones we saw was gisborne was down about 0.9 percent new plymouth down 0.3 percent and napier down 0.1 percent so effectively flat and i think that's been the really interesting part and the most re the, the biggest reason i suppose it was surprising for us was probably the timing of it it wasn't necessarily we weren't expecting to see this and a bit of weakness occurred throughout some of these regions who had seen such exceptional growth. It was the fact that we saw it so soon, you know, in a couple of months since those loan to value ratio restrictions have been brought in. So that was that was the thing for us. But uh, yeah, one that, you know, what are you seeing in the areas that you're, you know, present in where you guys are doing lots of mortgages and talking to lots of people on the ground there? Yeah, I mean, it's it was surprising for us too that it happened so quickly because uh, from our point of view, you know, the LVR uh, restrictions were implemented in March-ish, I think. Um, and so people would have had pre-approvals uh, that that would have still been live, right? So we're not, we wouldn't have expected a drop off so quickly. However, having said that, in those smaller areas, you know, Gisborne, New Plymouth, Napier, they, uh, they, they, they've got their local residents that are buying, but people were snapping them up because they were cheap and, and it's possible they just weren't cheap enough anymore um, for people to be kind of shopping in those areas anymore. And, and you've got the LVR restrictions coming in and we'll talk about a few of the other things later, but, but um, we, we did see a bit of a pullback from that, not necessarily in the home ownership area, but more the investment uh, portion of that. Um, you know, are they shopping in those areas anymore? Interesting to see whether, um, so did that affect Christchurch as well? Because a lot of investors from, say, Auckland were looking at Christchurch as a cheap uh, investment property area. Um, but having said that, 1.8% in a month is still, <laughs> it's still an amount, right? Like that's over a year, that's still kind of 20%, right? So it's, um, it, yeah, it's it's a very interesting topic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's, you know, there's always, let's put some context on that. And that is so true that 1.8% growth over a month, you know, 12 months ago, or whatever, would have looked fine. And it still mm. does. It's still a strong growth across the market. Um, but it's just because you've seen such strong growth recently that it has been a pullback. And it's the first time in a while that we've seen two months of that rate slowing down um, but yeah it's really important to point out that the nationwide values aren't going backwards or anything like that it is just a rate of growth slowing and I think that's really important but I think your other point there you know that's in 35 more than 35 percent growth in somewhere like Gisborne it was always going to be unsustainable uh, like you said the prices the values have now got to a level that people won't see that as you know, make as value for buying that property. And certainly they're going to be impacted trying to get the, the, the mortgage, get the deposit required to enter that market or to buy another property in that market. And I think that's where you do start to see the investors look elsewhere. Um, I know that when we saw the LVR restrictions a few years back where they were harsher in Auckland, we saw a number of Auckland investors travel down the, the highway to Hamilton where they could still have a small, small deposit and values were lower. And so of course they could continue to enter in the market, leverage their current properties and continue to extend their portfolio. So I'd expect something similar now, except the LVRs are in place nationwide. So you just go look at an area that has cheaper property. And I think Christchurch is obviously a really easy example there because of the main centers, it's effectively the, the lowest value. Um, so offering the most amount of, you know, most affordable um, because that price just hasn't seen the same growth in the last five or six years. Um, as we have around the rest of the country. So I think it's a really interesting one. And, and I think in terms of looking forward, this is what we're now looking at. You know, in the, in the growth phase, it's almost been boring because it's been up everywhere. And so you don't, you know, you, there's not much nuance there. You go, it's up here, it's up there, it's up everywhere. Yeah. 
Whereas now I think the questions we're getting and we're looking into is to say, well, if we do see a slowdown, maybe even a downturn, it could be uneven around the country. And that's what people are going to want to know. You know, is there more risk in certain areas than others? And there should be a number of factors we can pull together to try and understand where that might be. So that's where we're going to be focusing our time um, for the next few months to try and help our clients out. Even even intra-city, right? Like in Auckland, uh, you know, some areas of Auckland will continue to perform well and, and others won't. Uh, Wellington, which is uh, which has had a big boom um, over the past year or so, uh, will probably have some areas. So it's it's going to be some interesting data coming out. I'd actually forgotten about the uh, 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 regional LVR restriction. I think, I think I'd blocked it from my mind. To be honest, it was a bit of a nightmare. If you're a mortgage broker, I'd better try find was. try to find that line in Drury where uh, where it kind of ran through it. True. So, yeah. So um, happy to yeah happy to have uh, nationwide LVR restrictions. Yeah. Um, one of those things as well, easy. right? There's been so many changes since the LVRs initially got introduced in 2013. It is yeah. hard to keep up and look back and figure out what happened when. Um, and often I do have to be, you know, find myself going to the Reserve Bank website and going, when was that change on? And when yeah. did this one happen? Because you, know, you quickly lose track of all the changes that go on. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I mean, uh, have you got data around uh, at the first home buyer kind of versus investor? Um, you know, what, what are you seeing there? Yeah, I think that's the other key piece of data we've been looking at recently is how much that has changed. Again, it's not necessarily a surprise because given the changes have been harsher on investors, um, but what we've basically seen is we've seen those investors who were up around you know 28 odd percent in March even, they've dropped down to about 24% of sales um, in June. So it's a significant drop away. And you know the key thing there, I suppose, is first home buyers have essentially picked up the slack. Uh, they've gone from sort of 21% to 25%. So that 4% switch is basically gone from one to another. Um, and so I think that's that's not necessarily unexpected. The, the other thing we did look at was to say the last time the LVR restrictions were at 40% deposit requirement for investors, what happened in the you know preceding and couple of months afterwards? And interestingly, exactly the same trend back then has occurred right now. And so when, it wasn't too much of a surprise. And what that means for us is I think for the next couple of months, we kind of know what to expect because it's likely to be similar to what happened last time around. And I think what happened last time was it sort of, it sort of quickly dropped by about that four or five percent in, in a two or three month period. And then it started to level out as those investors still found a way or, you know, those ones that weren't affected by the LVRs or whatever still managed to keep active in the market that's appealing for one reason or another. I think the only other factor on the flip side of this, of course, is that we've got these extra government regulations coming in or that are in place kind of now um, with the tax deductibility changes for income um, uh, for costs, sorry, for your interest costs um, not being able to be deducted from your, your taxes at the end of the year. So I think that's an extra one that'll just make property less, less affordable, less- Changes the game, right? Business. Like it, yeah. And so I think we'll see the activity just diminish a little bit further because of that one. So yeah, I think that's the that's the key difference this time around. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean you don't want a policy to remove 100% of any sector, right? So if you had to guess about how many people would exit because of the LVR restrictions, you'd think about sort of 20% of, uh, of it would, that, that's ideally where a policy would do, take a little bit out, but not everyone. And uh, something like an LVR, where you know over the past year that that's totally equity based, uh, you know income is still the same, um, although we'll talk about that later. But um, uh, equity has grown, so you'd imagine that eighty percent of people who are looking to buy an investment property have had a large amount of equity growth in the past year, if they owned a property already, um, let alone more than one. So yeah, that doesn't totally surprise me, and you'd expect that to be about the same as as the sort of 2013 or, or last round of LVR implementations. Um, I think the tax one, I, I thought that was going to have more of an effect uh, on investors than we've seen in numbers and anecdotally in our clients. Um, when I heard those interest rate tax deductions, to me, uh, thinking about the financials and thinking about the cost of you know paying tax on income, that was quite a large one for me and it felt like quite a big hammer for the government to to pull out um maybe uh because buying an investment property is not so much as your own home but buying an investment property is an emotional decision uh as much as a numerical one um maybe people are still just kind of going through um we've had a couple of uh clients um 
just you know say we're still keen uh, to buy an investment property we'd quite like to see what the rules are going to be around new build um because they sound quite good <laughs> compared yeah, to generous. existing yeah yeah i mean you're talking probably fifteen thousand dollars a tax benefit um per year on a on a you know a, a decent rental kind of thing um so it's it's substantial so i think people will once that's clarified you'll probably see maybe an uptick in uh, investment buyers again, um, which will, you know, which will push out those first home buyers because there's only a finite amount of houses being built. Yeah. Um, but maybe first home buyers will move to the existing uh, existing market that is not a tax deductible, uh, you know, uh, property anymore. So, yeah. I think that's certainly one thing we will see. And, and interestingly, you know, when we look at our data, we have seen that first home buyers have been turning to new builds a lot over the last few years. You know, I think it was only seven or eight years ago, about 10% of new builds going to first home buyers. It's got closer to 30% um, um, in the recent amounts of data. And that's because they're favored to go there themselves. You know, you can usually buy a new build with a smaller deposit. And so they are beneficial. And also when you look at the price of new builds compared to existing properties, you get more bang for your buck. You know, you might have a chance to, you know, shape that house how you want it. Um, plus it's new. So hopefully it has less maintenance. So I think there's been good reason for those first home buyers turning to new build, but absolutely they're going to find that market much more crowded in the future. And so they probably are going to have to turn to the existing properties, which, you know, according to that, you'd expect not to see the same growth rates because there won't be the same demand for it. But one thing that's been interesting, talking to a few people, real estate agents and things, you know, they've been surprised that investors are still looking at existing properties, older properties, might have good bones or whatever, but they were like, you know, considering the purchase price, what rent you're going to get, and now you can't, and if you buy this property, you know, since the March 27, since the date this changed, you're now not going to be able to get that, that tax back on your interest costs, which does reduce your profitability considerably, and you could well be making a negative profit. And I think, you know, some of the, some of the points have been, when that investor realizes that maybe capital growth isn't there. So if you buy that property and you go, I'll take a loss because I know the growth of that market is going to chew that up and so I can handle that. If you don't see the same growth and we're already seeing that slowdown, at some point in the future, maybe a year or two, where they're carrying these losses forward, they're going to go, actually, it's not beneficial to do this, especially if they get a big bill, you know, for a new roof or something, 25 grand or something on top of the 10 grand loss that they've already carried over. So yeah. I do think that the, the impact could be big but it's probably going to be drawn out. I think firstly, of course, it's phased in for those already those investors that are already in the market. So they're not kind of not affected for a or very much for a wee while as it's slowly phased in. And for those people still buying properties, maybe, you know, like you say, they're not quite realizing the impact of this. And until they get to the end of their first financial year, especially if the capital growth isn't there, they're not gonna, you know, they're maybe not gonna realize quite how how much impact it has. Um, so I think we may be in for a bit more of a shock later on, and then, then we might see some decision making going on, because the only other factor I'll mention is I think the other problem people see is they don't see there being other places for them to put their money, and residential property is just what they've always been doing, they've heard about it from their friends or family, yeah. and so they just continue to do that, like you said, it's almost an emotional thing, and you go, well, if I'm holding for a long time, you know, for retirement, I'm not too worried about all these little things that are going to impact affordability or impact my profit. But actually, I think, you know, if you actually start to see that hit your balance, you know, at the end of the year or into two years, that's when it might start to hit home. So, yeah, it's probably a bit more down the track. I'd like to uh, forecast a correlation, maybe not this year or next year as they phase in the tax deductibility for existing properties, but maybe three or four years from now, I reckon June, July, you're going to see a whole bunch of houses go on the market in a time of year that typically you don't because it's winter. But you're going to get to the end of financial year. The accountant's going to hand them a bill for uh, fifteen thousand, twenty thousand dollars, thirty thousand dollars, and uh, I think you might find that people will suddenly reassess their, uh, their, their, you know, no. So I don't know. Exactly. I'm, yeah. That's my yeah. my line in the sand. I'm I'm putting down <laughs> cash flow affected, and um, like I said, if they have this in the capital growth, they're going to be like, actually, I need to sell this property. Yeah. Um, so I, I I totally agree. I think in the shorter term, there's also the bright line test that is kind of probably stopping people selling. You know, we heard about investors were going to list all their properties because of the the changes on March 23, but because they would have bought in the prior four or five years, if they sold now, they have to pay. A, a, capital gains tax on any profit they've made. Um, yep. Whereas the bear 
off to just hold on until that five-year period. So I think we might see little bubbles as people hit their five-year period and they go, it's not profitable anymore. I'm not going to have to pay a tax on my capital gain. So I am going to realize that that growth that I've seen over that period and, and, and bring that to market and that will see a lift in supply. So yeah, I do agree that there's that sort of, that sort of change where we might see that buyer and seller um, power change in the future is uh, it's probably a couple of years away. Yeah. And and more and more, just think about all of those things that have got to factor in, more and more people aren't going to just be able to do their uh, uh, accounting themselves. You know, it used to be uh, that was my income minus the interest and uh, and yeah, and 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 some capital gains. And if I sold it, this is how much I make. And I think those days are gone, right? Like there are so many little factors in there that could swing the amount of money that you pull out of a property sale by thirty forty thousand dollars uh that yeah yeah anyway upselling yeah. the accounting <laughs> I was gonna say, there's a few there's a few accounting suites out there that'll be happy you're talking up them because they try and simplify it all but uh that's right yeah, like you say it's not that easy just to for the normal guy off the or mum and dad you know investor off the road to to go mm. and do that so i think that will be some extra complexity yeah yeah and so then then we kind of get into the other side uh, of any mortgage equation which is kind of the income um which is uh yeah has been kind of in the in the news lately um around the debt to income ratios and yeah what's what's your thoughts on that yeah i mean our our take was always if the market slows down the reserve bank won't need to bring this in even if they've now got the mandate which they technically do i don't think it's written into the act just yet but they've essentially been given permission to to put that into the act so that if they want it in the future, they could implement some debt to income restrictions. Um, But our position, they always said it would take six months to implement. They always go through a consultation phase. So even when it happened last month or May or whatever it was, it was always unlikely to be implemented before November. I think now we're seeing a slowing in the market. You know, I think the Reserve Bank have said they're going to wait and see how the other changes impact the market before they do anything else. Um, that we're not going to see it happen this year anyway. And then by the end of the year, we are expecting growth to have slowed down to, you know, maybe quarterly growth will be closer to 0% by the end of the year. And I think at that point, they'll say, well, there's no need to put any extra restrictions on the market. Um, and then I think that's, we sort of say, so that might be over for in terms of restrictions or any government introduction of um, any changes for this cycle. And then the key thing would be when we do see the next cycle occur, we start to see values lift. At that point, they might look to you know, use a combination of the LVRs and the debt to income ratios, which they sort of talk about one protects the bank, one protects the consumer, the borrower. And so they might look to reduce the LVRs, but bring in some form of DTIs. But we are talking a wee bit down the road now. So that's our position. We don't think they're going to happen anytime soon. So no reason to freak out about it. Mm. But I was interested to know, what has it meant for you guys? Have you had discussions of people going, I've heard about this, what does it mean? Are they trying to get in before thinking what, something might come in? And then from a really practical perspective, you know, how would it actually impact the market? Like if there was these restrictions on at you know seven times income, I think it would have been for investors, five or six for owner occupiers. Do you have a feel for what sort of impact that would have to the market? Like you said, maybe 20% or hopefully not knocking everyone out. Yeah, well, that will be the magic number, right? What what takes that, yeah, that 20% of the market out? What what number multiple takes them out without taking out a lot too many people, right? Um, so there is actually one bank which is loosely implemented DTIs and a sort of show of responsibility. Um, it's it's not even really in their calculators that we get, but they they run it through a DTI test um, of about seven uh, times. So that's about the market. Um, I, for me, DTIs, would, it'd be a little sad for the banks. The banks can play with income uh, dependent on the risk appetite. So if they've got a, you know, if they've got a risk appetite, they might be able to allow bonuses um, over, averaged over the past two years, or they might be able to do, you know, um, commission based, kind of be a bit looser on that. And if you've got a hard line in the sand for those people, and there will be policies from the Reserve Bank around what they can accept and what they can't, uh, then you, you're not going to have the banks being able to be as flexible um, in those sort of grey areas uh, for some applicants. And there is a surprising amount of people that fall into that grey area. You think about people that get working for families, um, you know, uh, income from their ex-spouses or something like that. Um, there is a lot of ways that people earn income, so it's it's a little messy. Uh, so, um uh, yeah, as I, I completely agree. It's not imminent and on, you know, and incoming in the next few months and 
but I'd, I'd like to see them stay out if they can. Uh, the other thing is that, is it uh, global debt that they're talking or just mortgage debt? Uh, and so when I say global debt, you know, credit cards, high purchases and things, um, or is it uh, or is it just mortgages? And so they'll, they may have a play around with that. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I think if they implement it, it'll be for a good reason uh, because the market's going crazy again. LVRs aren't doing what they're meant to do, and uh, and that that's why they'll think about it. So, yeah, if it comes, it comes. But uh, but yeah, we would certainly prefer not to see it to give that flexibility to the applicant. Uh, yeah. I think that's a really good point. I think that flexibility is the key, right? And we know that, like I said, banks are testing this. You guys know how those serviceability checks are going on. And you have that matchup to go, yes, you know, your uncommitted monthly income could afford to pay this mortgage even if interest rates lifted. You know, there's all these tests going on. And the Reserve Bank acknowledged that, that there's a number of different, you know, um, implementation ways of, of putting this in. Um, whether it's debt to income, whether it's mortgage to income, whether you just look at having a, a floor serviceability test, they, they talked about as well. So there's a number of different things here, but the one they're focused on is debt to income, which does seem almost too simple. Our example we talk about is it seems crazy that a couple earning 200 grand could afford the same property as someone as a couple who had 200 grand but four kids. You know, clearly their ability yeah. to, borrow, to borrow and get that property is very, very different and debt to income doesn't look at that at all. But the mm. banks were looking at that. And so it is you know, interesting to see how you justify just having this, this overall cap. Um, but the other side of that, of course, or the fur further on down from that would be it would really limit the amount of properties any investor would be able to own. Because you'd almost never be able to earn enough income to own more than, I don't even know, two, three, four properties maybe. Because I, you'd I can, to own I that can, many properties would be impossible. Yeah, I can take a run at that actually because um, um, currently the way the banks do it is they scale your income. So if you, for easy numbers, if you earn $10,000 of rental a year, which would be a strangely small rental, um, they will take $7,500 or $8,000. They scale it for, for rates and repairs and, and uh, vacancies and things like that. So it turns out that the way that it, it works out is you need about a 10% yield on your rental property, which is yeah, it would be a questionable property if it's if it's got that. Um, you need about ten percent to perpetually keep getting enough income as you buy. Um, forget about equity, just income. You need about a ten percent yield, and it that's a lot. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. By any no, measure, that's, I mean, so. that's a really good point, and that's exactly what my question was like. You know, this will limit large scale investors. Um, so you know, and maybe that's the intent. Who knows? Um, you know, and, and I, I think there'd be a strong debate against that as well. That sometimes professional property investors do a better job than the casual mum and dad on the street. So, you know, that would be a really interesting unintended or maybe intended consequence of something like that. We have to wait and see. But interesting, you talk about the um, amount of rent that they would, you know, use to to go against service on income servicing a mortgage. I remember back. And was it a month or so ago where ANZ explicitly came out and basically said that due to the um, interest cost deductibility changes, that they were changing their formulas that essentially said for an existing property, um, you will now, we will only use 65% of your rent and your serviceability for your income, whereas for a new build, it stays at 75%. So it's quite interesting to see a really explicit figure there, which shows that absolutely for investors, they're going to be encouraged towards those new builds because when you get those changes from a government perspective, everyone wants to know what impact from a dollar perspective, you know, and to see that from ANZ, you know, and like you said, probably 15 grand for a typical property um, that it could cost you in your tax every year. I think that was a figure we got close to as well, um, but probably closer to, you know, 700 bucks in the first year because of the phase reduction, which is why we didn't expect to see an immediate reaction. So yeah, it's nice to get some real numbers around those as well, and it does help you get a feel for what the real impact might be um, as these things are or aren't implemented. That that number from ANZ, the sixty five percent, that was actually um, higher than I thought it was going to be. If um, I mean, if you think they they had, I can't remember exactly if ANZ had seventy five percent, but let's say they had a seventy five percent scaling. Now though, you're now paying tax on that seventy five percent, so it would be reasonable for them to take thirty percent off that, right, and and scale it to fifty percent. So I thought sixty five wasn't actually terribly onerous, um, considering the implications of those uh, tax deductibility. But yeah, yeah, that's a good point. It's, yeah, it's a very good point. Um, no, I like it. Well, um, I thought maybe the, the other key topic right now, I'm sure it is for you guys as well, is interest rates. 
you know, what's happening with interest rates. And of course, we just had uh, the Reserve Bank come out with the, their latest monetary policy review where they can change the official cash rate, the OCR. They chose not to, but they have ceased, or well, basically in a week or so, they've ceased to buy any more government bonds. So essentially stop their money printing. So a bit of a sign of the, the uh, economy not needing quite the amount of support that it has in the past. So there's lots going on in the space. I know we've started to see interest rates, especially long-term interest rates, start to lift. Um, we even recently saw a couple of banks move their short-term interest rates ahead of the Reserve Bank decision, which was quite interesting and obviously not directly related to the OCR, but in anticipation of it later in the year, maybe. So, mate, I mean, where do you start with interest rates? What's what's your take at the moment? Do you get your crystal ball out? Do you try and avoid that? What's your what's your I, current take? Uh, you know, I, I I wrote an article on my prediction for interest rates 2022, and about four hours after that. Uh, the uh, ASB upped their <laughs> interest rate. It was out of date already. So yeah, it, it's it's very much crystal ball gazing. Um, I mean, I, I that's the way we thought it was going to go, right? I mean, you, we might have seen a, a tip to 1.99, but no one really thought uh, we were going to continue down. So um, so we, we're now looking at least one bank with 2.55 for one year, uh, being a short where they were 2.19. Uh, I mean, the, impl uh, the implication of that sort of $360 per hundred thousand that you're borrowing. So it could be a couple of grand um, for a mortgage uh, at, or, or more, two or three thousand dollars easily per annum um, that that means. Uh, so <clears throat> I mean that would seem the way to do it. The, the interesting thing about it is that um, those who are rolling off this month fixed a year ago or, or longer so are probably on the 2.5% from last year anyway. Uh, it will be the ones that fix this year for 2.19 that will come off in a year's time or January or February next year or whatever that come off on 2.5 that are going to have that interest rate shock, uh, I think. So you're not going to see that immediate, but mm. it's a it's an indicator, right, for, uh, for where interest rates are going. And it'll be interesting to see whether the other banks follow suit or whether they um, leave ASB out there on the hook uh, with their higher rates. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what do you think uh, in terms of, you know, um, how are people going to react to this? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, first to say that, that expectations on OCR are changing so fast. You know, a month ago, it was yeah. tipped to lift in the second half of 2022. You know, and then a couple of weeks later, it was, oh, it could be the start of 2022. And then it was shifted to, oh, there's a chance for November. And now more of the economists than not are tipping next month. We're literally yeah. saying a month away in August where the Reserve Bank might lift that OCR. So I think it just shows how fast this is moving and it could, it could shift even quicker. We've got inflation data coming out tomorrow, which is Friday. Um, and that could, that could well be another thing that influences the market as to their expectations as well. So there's, there's just so much going on in the space that it is changing literally daily. Um, I think my feel, reading the Reserve Bank statement yesterday, I'm still leaning towards November. Everyone sort of talks about inflation being the key thing everyone's watching for. And the Reserve Bank talk about the inflation being quite one-off in its nature and temporary. And if that is the case, then they wouldn't want to get ahead of that because then it starts to come down and they might lift the OCR too high. So it does seem to me that they'll be more conservative and leave it for now. And so November is still my time, that my, my expectation for that. But again, it could change tomorrow. Um, and I, I think the other, the other part of this, of course, um, is, is what people are doing. It's, it's people's expectations. You know, we have seen people drift away very minor from those one year and, and lower rates in the last couple of months, where I think it's peaked at sort of 79% of people a few weeks ago um, were on the floating or fixed rate less than a year. And that's dropped to about 76 or 77%. So we've already seen people start to drift away from that because of expectations, because of what we're talking about, because of the economists, everyone talking about, you know, next time you come up, you're gonna, you're gonna have a higher interest rate. And then now the question is, you know, what impact could that have on the market? How would people be able to handle seeing their mortgage payments lift for probably the first time or first time in at least five or six years, if not their lifetime, depending on how long they've obviously had that property? And, and I'd be keen to get your guidance on, you know, how do you think people could handle that? How have people managed when they've seen interest rates drop and they have been able to refix at a lower rate? Um, do they continue to pay the same? So they're paying the mortgage off faster or are they happy to go sweet and lower my payment and spend my money elsewhere? Because I think that depending on the share of that, 
that could influence how people adjust when it goes the other way too. Um, if they have to actually shift their, their spending habits or, or maybe they can't shift their spending habits so they are going to be forced into some harder decisions. Yeah, I think, look, about half uh, our clients would say, as they roll off a higher rate, they would say, let's just keep the payments the same and, and therefore reduce the term of the mortgage. So I think there's, there's, a, there's a good portion of mortgage homeowners who have done that. Not, not every time, but, you know, that they've, they've really tried their best to keep payments high because the, the pain you've already um, felt at 4% interest rate, you know, when it dropped down to 3.2, you might as well just keep the pain there, right? So there is, there is definitely a percentage of people that, that have done that well and therefore paid down their mortgage relatively quickly. The, and 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 really hasten to say that there are a number of reasons why you might only pay minimum uh, mortgage payments. So that's it's not a guilt trip or judgment by any means. You know anyone who's expecting a baby or or, or whatever um, can adjust those. So, um, but I think uh, um, you know we've discussed this before about uh, the pain of going from say two point two percent to uh, two point five or three um, percent is that. At 2.2%, typically people, uh, you know, they spend on luxuries or, or, or um, you know, uh, disposable kind of income. They get rid of it at, you know, takeaways or Uber Eats or they might get a Sky uh, connection or they might buy a car um, and rack up some debt there because, you know, they were tested on their mortgage at 6.5% and now they got that and then they ended up only paying 2.2%. Uh, so they've got a, an element of free money. The trouble is when that money gets taken, uh, gets demanded to pay your mortgage, you know, uh, on a higher rate, uh, what do you get rid of and how easily can you get rid of it uh, equals the amount of pain that an interest rate shock has. So if you've got savings going away each month where you just, you just allocate that to the interest rate, it's not, not the best way to allocate a savings amount, but, but if it's locked on a car loan, that's hard to get rid of, right? That's you, you can't sell a car immediately and recoup the amount you paid for it. Uh, if you're locked into, um, you know, a, a subscription that maybe forces you in for a year or something, a um, cell phone bill, for instance, uh, then you can't easily get rid of that. So that's kind of why we're, we're pitching towards, start planning towards 3% or 4% or 5% of mortgage now, um, even if you can't do it today, uh, you know, what does 4% on your mortgage look like? And what does it take to get there in, say, the next six months or a year? And if you can do that, then uh, the day that comes when you have to refix that 4%, the, uh, the, the pain isn't going to be as severe because you've mm -hmm. got rid of those excessive expenses. Um, one thing I will say while, I, while I'm on that topic is there are a variety of ways that banks allow you to pay additional make additional payments on your mortgage with, with no penalty. And there are, uh, most banks have quite a um, reasonable way of doing it. Some allow up to a 5% lump sum deposit, which would mean you'd have to stick savings away each week and then put that lump sum across. Most of the banks allow some sort of increase to your payments midterm uh, on fixed. So, you know, if you can figure out, oh, I'm paying $500, but at, I've got no idea what the calculations, but let's say $500 a week and at 4%, it would be $650. Ask your bank about how you would uh, increase it to $650 uh, and, and sort of get used to that pain. And then any, any interest rate rises in the future are kind of not going to severely affect anyone really uh, probably just as a disclaimer for that typically if you increase the payments you can't then reduce them again very easily in the fixed term so just have to think about that as well but yeah i mean yeah it's it's going to be interesting how people react there's going to be a, an amount of people that feel um a sinking feeling just that haven't seen interest rate rises in um in you know in a long term uh, from a mortgage broker perspective you know we haven't had to worry about presenting an interest rate and then three days later it actually went up and we've got to deliver some bad news it's been probably six years since we had to give that bad news to anyone um so yeah there is, it is a changing market for sure uh, yeah. and people will be reassessing it yeah no, I mean, that is really interesting. And like I say, it's just, you know, we have relatively short memories, most of us, and I think it is hard to think back to any time like that. And I think the key point you got there is it is people and whether they've got committed or uncommitted income, what they, you know, what those levels or expenses are at as to how they're going to adjust for this in the future as well. And I do think that, you know, because we mostly fix, as you said, the rates they're coming off might not be 
you know, as low as maybe right now or they were last couple of months. So the shock might not be quite as bad either. Um, I know that many people will split their mortgages as well. So they'll have coming off at different rates. And so they should have a bit of flexibility there too. So our expectation isn't for a significant shock to many people. I think the other thing we didn't quite touch on with the OCR was despite the fact that there's, you know, forecast picking you know a lift it's mostly a lift of 0.25 you know next time and then maybe another one within the six months you know it's a very slow and gradual rise to the point where you know even the reserve bank is sort of saying it might get to two percent within three years or so so we're not talking about this lift of the ocr even back to one percent within the year maybe you know when you think that the emergency drop came in um, as COVID hit, it went from, I think, 1% to 0.25, you know, a drop of 0.75%, yeah. which is unprecedented. And we're not even talking about going back to what those normal levels were. So it is, it's not like we're talking about interest rates going from the current 2, 2.5% to, you know, you paying on your mortgage 5 or 6% within yeah. the next year or so. It is gradual and it should be manageable. But I think the, the, the other flip side of that, of course, is people say, well, we've got so much debt right now that even a small rise from those small amounts could still impact some people. And I think that's where it will come down to what other committed um, expenses they have, how are they going to be able to handle that one? Or is it just a, a little bit of not going to buy, you know, um, as many beers at the pub that weekend or, you know, or, or go out as frequently for dinner, or maybe you do have to get rid of your, your food box or whatever it might be. So those things that are mm. relatively flexible as opposed to like say subscriptions or, or big sparkle purchases or cars or something like that. Um, yeah. And that's probably going to be the telling factor, I think. Mm -hmm. yep. hey, one yeah. Thing we one thing we didn't talk about earlier, and I know we probably we probably should um, wrap up very shortly, was when we talked about the strength of first-time buyers right now, they've been pretty strong for a wee while now. Yes, it's a competitive market, but certainly something that did the rounds in the, in the media the last week or so has been how first-time buyers have been using the bank of mum and dad to get into the market. It's a really hard one to get too much hard data from. The mum and yeah. dads don't necessarily go on the title anymore. From what I've heard talking to banks and, and, and the brokers like yourself, um, it's it's mostly them giving gifts. So there's no real tracking of that. But so I was interested to hear, you know, how, how from your perspective, how are those first home buyers continuing to afford to get into the market? We're seeing them adjust their expectations using KiwiSaver, but how much are they using their mum and dad to help them out at the moment? Yeah, we we try to get the data out of the banks too, and then they they just don't track that. It's um, I would say anecdotally, we are sitting around the sixty to seventy percent uh, wow. of first home buyers um, uh, use some sort of assistance from Bank of Mum and Dad. Now, I think it's probably important to to um, uh, explain that in terms of sometimes it is on the title and helping with income. Sometimes it's a gift. Sometimes it's a loan that needs to be repaid back either regular payments or, or, you know, upon sale of the property. Um, but, but there's certainly some assistance there. By far the most common one is a gift or a loan. Uh, we prefer a, um, a long-term loan uh, just in terms of um, uh, divorces, <laughs> matrimonial separations, you know, it's, it, it is fundamentally an early inheritance from your parents uh, if it's a gift. Um, and and so just for clients to think about, you know, getting that wrapped up in, in, in um, you know, uh, matrimonial separation kind of and assets and things. Um, but yeah, look, there, there's, and it, it skews a little bit to Auckland, um, you know, in the smaller towns where you, you only need 600,000, wasn't only, I only need 600,000. <laughs> It's still a lot, yeah. Um, but but there, there's less of that because with with KiwiSave you can sort of get to that that ten percent a little easier. But yeah, in Auckland, um, high, and and it's it's. I mean, mum and dad have had a, uh, a, a like the investors have had some equity growth if they own a property in the past ten years. Um, uh, however, there is a discussion around uh, when do they need that money back? So um, if they're going to equity release it in three or four years time, you give that to the kids, the kids then do a top up in three or four years time. Uh, are they going to, if they definitely need it in three or four years time, that's quite a risky maneuver, right? So um, yeah, there's, there's a question around that. But the most common thing we see is trying to get your kids to that magical 20% deposit because that's where the rates come down and banks are a lot looser with their policy. They allow you to have flatmates and things. So first home buyers really want to get to that 20% deposit um, and, and any help that mum and dad can do to get that often benefits the, the uh, kids buying substantially in terms of just even interest rate um, uh, rates that they get from the bank. Of course. 
So quite a good thing, really. Yeah, and, and not at all surprising that we're seeing seeing such a large kind of thing. I mean, who, who as a twenty five year old had one hundred and fifty thousand dollars floating around, seventy five thousand dollars each, even if it's a couple floating around their account, right? So it's unsurprising. Exactly. Yeah, and I think that's where this you know um, generation debate comes in, and, and you know this K shaped recovery and you know inequality increasing as well, and that's where it gets all very emotional. I know you know Bernard Hickey is certainly very big on this, is saying if you don't have parents that own property and you're not going to be able to afford it, then you're kind of buggered forever, and that's where I think it gets very um, political as well. And I think that's why we're seeing so much debate, you know, either way on this one, because these are the sorts of things that are so common right now that if you don't have parents, then it's it is difficult to get into the market if that's something that you are aspiring to do. Um, interesting, you talk about obviously you know they want to get to that magic twenty percent, and, and absolutely that's obviously preferable for first home buyers. The one thing I've sort of been at pains to continue to talk about recently, and it's because when I talk to brokers, advisors like yourself, bankers, they do often say that sometimes the the idea, the the perception of the LBRs impacts buyers or potential buyers more than the reality. Um, and you look at the Reserve Bank data and also respect that you know there's a speed limit for how much the banks can actually do with less than a 20% deposit for owner occupiers. Um, so they can actually do up to 20% of all owner occupier loans with less than a 20% deposit. So yes, you want to get there, there's benefits of doing it, but you don't have to get there to get into the market. And actually for yeah. first home buyers, they're the ones that are usually using that allowance. So we look at the reserve bank data, it's about 35 to 36% of all first home buyers are getting a mortgage, you know, getting that loan, without a 20% deposit. So they're the ones that actually go outside that. Yes, they might pay some higher fees or whatever it is, but for them, it's a it's a big long-term purchase. They're going to live in that property. And so they'll harbor that for a short term just to get into that market, especially as the market's been growing significantly. So I always kind of want to point that out that yes, there's a barrier. Yes, there's benefits to get to there, but it's not absolutely necessary. 10% can do the job um, for any aspiring first-time buyers that are out there anyway. It absolutely kills me when I hear people say, oh, I wish I could buy a first home, but I don't have 20% deposit. And, and if I could fly a banner across New Zealand and just say that it, it is absolutely possible at 10%. Um, the criteria is a little bit higher, but it is not impossible at all. Yeah. And there is there is there is quite a bit of money out there for those low deposit loans. Um, and even more if you're buying a new build. Uh, exactly. Because, because it's unlimited essentially. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. It's um for those who are who are wish they could get into their first home but but have waited because they don't have uh, 120000 or 180000 dollars Yeah, it's it's a good message to hear is that that it's okay at 10% uh, often. Mm. Exactly. And yeah, and the reason mm. it always came up for me was I remember talking to a mortgage advisor and he said it was amazing when the LBRs were temporarily removed, all these people came and talked to them and they'd assess them and go, why didn't you see me last month? You still could have got a mortgage. It didn't matter. The LBRs have gone off, but they just saw in the media, no LBRs. And they thought, sweet, we can go and talk to someone now. It's like, you should have gone and talked to them anyway, because you just never know where you can squeeze around the rules or, or make things work for you, especially if you've got decent income. So yeah, I do mm. think it's a, it's a good reminder to always throw in there. Yeah, yeah, the one message to take away from today. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey cool. well, um, great to yeah. chat. I don't know if you've got any other things that were burning on your mind to to chat. That's the that's the main things really is the uh, you know the the changes in the policies around LVRs and potentially DTIs and um, you know interest tax deductibility and things. So you know that is that is the main things in the market at the moment. So yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for the chat. Yep, no, great having a yarn, mate. And uh, when we put this on my podcast, our podcast, we need to give you a plug for yours. So do you want to give a plug for your podcast and then I'll plug mine for yours? Yeah, so our, our podcast is Everything Mortgages and available on all of those places that you get podcasts. So just, just search Everything Mortgages and, uh, and you'll find us. Good on you. And for us, it's the New Zealand Property Market Podcast. So please do check us out, available on all the podcasts as well um, and, and, and let us know what you think. So awesome, mate. Great to chat. Thanks very much. Thanks, man.